Hello fellow problem solvers. So, today we're going to be doing a problem from the Asian Pacific Math Olympiad 2013 problem number 2. This is a phenomenal number theory problem to try out if you've never dealt with the floor of something, especially the square root under it as well. Ooh. And especially if you're getting somewhat comfortable with, the with divisibility, with number theory and stuff like that, if you feel like you can take it on to the next level. You know, you've done a couple of junior level competitions, some problems, you want to go to the next one, and you're feeling decently comfortable, you don't want to try out too hard, this is a great problem. And try it out for a minimum of 20 minutes, ideally 45 to an hour and 15, not more than two hours. If you'd like to go along with us, pause for the next five to 10 minutes and see how would you work with this problem. And now let's begin. So, the first question is, what do we do with this? Like, it's a square root of n, the floor, it then squared? Like, what is this? Well, let's look at it sort of like cases by cases. If n was, say, 10, what would the floor of the square root of 10 be equal to? So let's actually first look at the square root of 10. It's 3 point something, right? It's not bigger though, it's not, it's less than 16, so it's not 4 point something, it's bigger than, bigger than 9, so 3 point something. And then the floor of that number is free, right? The greatest integer not, the greatest integer less than or equal to r, the square root of 10, is equal to 3 then. Now we have 3 squared, which is a 9. So we care about which two squares this is between. And if you didn't figure this out, I mean, now, how are we going to actually represent n? Well, we care the integer k, such that n is between k squared, but it's less than k plus 1 squared. Now what does this mean for n? Well, it means we can represent it of the form k squared plus r, where r is less than or equal to 2k and greater than or equal to 0. And now what does this become? I invite you to pause for the next 2 minutes, 3 to 5 minutes, and try to work on this now if you didn't figure this out so far. And here's what we have. The square root of n, the floor of it, becomes k. So we get k squared, we get k squared plus 2, divides n squared plus 2. n squared is going to be k squared plus r squared plus 1, actually, my mistake. And now what do we have from this divisibility? Pause for two minutes, figure that out. And the way I would write this is k squared plus 2 plus r minus 2 squared plus 1. And now I know that when I have the square of this, the 2 times this times this, I'll only be left with r minus 2 squared. So in fact, from here we have k squared plus 2 divides r minus 2 squared plus 1. Okay, what do we do now? Here's where I invite you to pause for the next 5-10 minutes and figure out what is it that you should do now that you have this divisibility relationship. I only wrote it like this because I don't want to expand at the moment, but wait a second. r is less than or equal to 2k, we're than or equal to 0. So this thing right here, we have a divisibility, but this thing can't be, like it's not so much greater than this. And divisibility, a divides b, means there exists a c such that a times c is equal to b. So what do we do with that here now? Pause for about five minutes and think about it. And the answer is, well, here what we do is we say, okay, this is some k squared plus 2 times some say d is equal to squared plus 1 squared plus 1. Now we know that, say, this part right here is less than or equal to, instead of r, if I put in 2k, 2k minus 2 squared, though to be frank, like there might be an edge case between with k equal to 1, that I think might be the, the only edge case where, you know, it's r is equal to 2k isn't the best one. The best one if r, if k is equal to 1, then the best one is when r is equal to 1. In other words, when n is 2. Well, we can sort of check that out and see like that. This is actually the best possibility. So 
that's less than this squared plus one, which is equal to four times k minus one squared plus one. And now we know that this thing is in fact strictly less than what is what we have here. We have four, we're gonna have four times k squared plus two. Like this is something that is I, I, could, I could say obvious if I wanted to. If I wanted to be incredibly precise, this is true if and only if free is less than 8k is, 8K is greater than free. So for every single k, for k greater than 1, this is true. And now this implies that d is less than 4. And so we have three possibilities. d is either 1, 2, or 3. And that's it. So now let's deal with those cases and unless you have something better than do, that is what I would do here. And I invite you to pause for the next five to 10 minutes and try to you know, deal with a couple of these cases, right? Let's start off from d equals one and move our way up. So if we had d equals one, we'd have k squared plus two is equal to r minus two squared plus one. Okay. Now, Let's get rid of this, and we have k squared plus 1 is equal to r minus 2 squared. So these are two successive squares which differ by 1. The only two squares which differ by 1 are 0 and 1. We can also write this down as a difference of squares. Depending on the level of competition where you're at, you might just want to write this down as a difference of squares, and then you have 1, so this can be 1 times 1, or minus 1 times minus 1. If you're in a high level competition, you can just say the only two squares which differ by one are zero and one. That would imply k is zero, but that's, that would imply that n is greater than or equal to zero less than one. In other words, n would be zero, but that's not a positive integer. So this just falls off right away. Now let's look at d is equal to two. We'd have two k squared plus two times two is four r minus 2 squared plus 1. So we get rid of the 1. This becomes a 3. And now what do we do? I invite you here, you know, pause for a few minutes. Work with this. What are your ideas? Okay, I'm, you can look at like the specific values for r, right? r in terms of like now, say k plus 2 plus some t between this. Like you can maybe make this look nicer, very much quote unquote. And then so like quadratic perhaps in K, or maybe do some factoring there. Do I look at this and I say, okay, let me see if I can just do something quicker than that to begin with. Like I'll do that if I can't figure anything quicker out. Let's see, say modulo three, right? If K is indivisible by three, then this is we're gonna have two k squared is congruence to r minus two squared. So we have two a squared is equal to b, is congruence to b squared modulo three. We know that the squares modulo three either give a zero or a one. So from this congruence to this modulo three, we get that both of these are divisible by three. However, in that case, this is divisible by nine, this is divisible by nine, which forces this thing to be divisible by nine. However, nine doesn't divide three, a contradiction. So this case also fails. Again, if this was hard to follow, modulo three to maybe try to solve a easier number theory problem than this one. Now, and then come back to this, right? Come back to this, solve an easier one. I was really just looking at modulo three. And then the final case is when these equal three, I'm gonna get three k squared plus now what? I'm gonna have it plus six, then let's do the minus one immediately. So three k squared plus five is r minus two squared. What do we do here? Again, pause for three minutes, see if you get any sort of idea here. And for me, the answer is okay. A square, a square. Let's see, modulo three. Okay, modulo three, I get, I'm done immediately because then this is zero. We get two is congruent to some r minus two squared modulo three which means some b squared is two modulo three, impossible. And that's it. 
right? Because squares only give zero or one as remainders modulo three. And so this one also doesn't have a solution. And with that, we've shown that, okay, this D needs to be less than four if there's a solution, but for every single one of these cases, we get there isn't a solution. And so this never has a solution when n is an integer. It's kind of strange to have that. Well, let's double check our work. It seems good. Everything seems fine, right? That's a bit strange, but the math is the math. The math is correct. So we are done. And this finishes up a problem. And I think it's a cool little practice thing because especially if you've never seen this thing with the this floor of the square root, Oof, how do I deal with that? Usually you're trying to see like the substance, like how can I describe this number? And it seems like, oh no, I had n, now I have two things, I have k and r. But in reality, no, you didn't just have n. You had this, this is not n. It looks like n. I feel like it's a square, like this floor is kind of messing me, I should really be able to get the n. But you can't. This is, you don't have n here. No, you don't, you don't, you don't. Say goodbye to the n, bye bye n, and say hello to the k and r. And this finishes up our beautiful little problem from the Asian Pacific Math Olympic Print 13. And as always, thanks for problem solving.